go. Break it down, put it there. Bring it on, step it up. Right there, break it down, put it there. Here we go, step it up. Bring it on, let's go. Uh. Hello everyone, welcome to our last program of this quarter of Studium Generale. Welcome to the program organized by the World Press Photo and Studium Generale in uh, collaboration. It's an online uh, program, as you can see, whereas the World Press is definitely an uh, offline exhibition that we were very happy to host uh, the last 10 years or even more. And uh, I saw that there were already a lot of viewers and uh, they were awaiting this program because it's the only way we can present a little bit about uh, this marvelous exhibition that we are ha so happy to feature. We had to postpone it for four times and after the last time we had to decide, okay, then this, this is it and we have to come up with some other sort of solution. So tonight we have two marvelous speakers, Samira, Samira D'Amato from the, the World Press uh, Photo Organization and Esther Horvath, uh, one of the winning photographers. But first of all, let me explain why we are so fond of having the World Press photo in our buildings normally. We are so happy with it because uh, the World Press photo very much represents a world that is dominated by pictures, pictures that tell stories, pictures that are essential to understand what the world is all about and how we can come up with new thoughts and uh, to sharpen our ethical uh, verdicts when it comes to all sorts of conflicts in the world. So we visit every kind of world when we visit the exhibition. It's sometimes gripping, it's sometimes very moving, it's sometimes also comforting, but it's always a very emotional ex experience to visit the world press. And for that reason, it very much aligns uh, with our mission as Studium Generale. Studium Generale is uh, very much about broadening the horizon of our students and in uh, every uh, possible way the World Press photo does that for our students and every other visitor. But tonight it's an online show and um, uh, we are going to uh, discuss a lot of pictures and we can also, also discuss the background of the World Press and it is uh, uh, my pleasure to announce the first speaker but before that maybe you will wonder uh, if it, is it possible to register for use well that's of course possible at the end of the show we will have an opportunity to fill in the form and then you're registered for uh, the use but now i give the floor to our first guest samira damato the floor is yours go ahead thank you very much lucas um, thank you very much also to, to Studium Generale and to, to you Eindhoven. I'm very, very happy that we could be uh, so solution oriented um, and being able to set up uh, this lecture. I also am very saddened that we weren't able to have the exhibition this year. Um, but I, I also am happy that we can have the opportunity to speak about these incredible images um, and uh, be able to look at um, some of the winners of this year and talk about them more extensively. So uh, I'd like to start my presentation by um, speaking about uh, World Press Photo and the Foundation. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, I cannot see the presentation. <laughs> um, apologies. Uh, sorry, I'm having some technical issues. Could somebody assist yeah. me with this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Fantastic. Here comes, yeah. Fantastic. All right. So I'd like to take a moment to just talk about what World Press Photo really is. Um, so I'm Samira D'Amato. I am a representative of the foundation. Um, and I work as an exhibition manager and curator, which in 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic has been a challenge um, and something that we feel very strongly about in facilitating in other forms, for example, this educational aspect. So our foundation at a glance consists of um, exhibitions in which we are able to showcase the collection of photographs that are uh, independently selected by a jury of uh, various professionals from around the world. Um, and we cater to public events such as this, create lectures, educational programs around the collections that we have and the industry of photojournalism. We also um, 
are extremely proud of our position within education of photojournalism and within the education of photographers globally. And we do so by um, creating various workshops um, in, uh, um, in multiple countries where we try and engage uh, photojournalists who may not be as uh, often represented within our media cycle as what we frequently see. Alongside this, uh, we have, of course, our photo contest, which is an annual photo contest where photos from the previous year are eligible. Um, and a selection is made of some of the best pieces of photojournalism. We have eight various categories that include sport photography, portraiture, um, long-term projects, spot news, general news, nature, and more recently, environment. And I think we will speak also somewhat uh, in more detail about the environment category, which is something that the World Press Photo Foundation felt needed to be amplified uh, within the global visual culture, as often these images are not given enough of a platform as the urgency that they actually convey deserve. Alongside that, uh, we use the uh, content of uh, these contests, the entrance that we have, to create an analysis and understand what the industry uh, really looks like. Who are the photographers behind the images? Are we representing inclusivity and diversity? Um, we also create multiple articles. Uh, I'd also recommend uh, following us on our social media output because we have multiple writers who go into in-depth um, pieces about various aspects of photojournalism. And um, we have other uh, sources, for example, the Africa Photo da uh, Photojournalist Database, where we create um, an overview of various photojournalists on the African continent so that we can bring better in connection local photographers when, uh, when we're looking at stories that they might be more equipped to depict. So overall, the World Press Photo Foundation offers all of this um, within the context of a free contest. So the importance of having a free contest um, is to ensure that um, there is a fairness in who is able to enter so that there does not become a hindrance in who is able to actually apply within our contest. And this also allows us to have a very high caliber of, uh, of photographic works. So now I'd like to look at the next slide, which is um, a map of the world. And I uh, use this very frequently simply to talk about um, how we choose to portray the world. Now, many of you may be familiar with this map, um, but it very much differs from the map that we frequently see. And the reason that I bring this up is because the world that we see is defined by those who, uh, who, who speak out. So this, uh, this depiction also shows that the way that we portray the world is not necessarily exactly the same as what it really is. And this is the power of visual journalism to shape the world we see. This is why inclusivity and diversity and the voices and photographers behind the images is so important to be able to create a more expansive uh, representation of the world and the stories that matter. So now I would like to go on to the next slide and talk shortly with you about the jury. So this was, um, as we are now entering our 2021 uh, contest year, uh, this is an overview of our independent jury. Now, the World Press Photo Foundation in itself acts as a platform. We reach out to multiple uh, professionals within the sector and we create um, a contest structure that uh, begins with a specialized jury for every category. As you can see, Esther Horvat is also within this image and I'm very excited that I will be able to introduce her later today. Uh, she uh, won within the 2020 contest and was a jury member for the 2021 contest. Now, the specialized jury starts off by looking at thousands of images. On average, we have over 47,000 photographs submitted annually. And the 
contest structure is separated into um, multiple rounds, starting off with a specialized jury dedicated to their own category. The specialized jury begins with thousands of images and almost in a gut reaction has to speak uh, with a sort of yes or no system for the first round of entrance. Once the first selection is made, which can go from 100 images to 500 images, um, the second round begins where more extensive conversations, discussions around the photographs between the jury begins. In this second round, uh, a bit of information around the images is also uh, available to the judges to make their decisions. But as uh, I will explain a bit uh, later on, we have multiple um, entry checks to ensure that the information behind the images and the images themselves are not doctored um, and remain um, factual. So based on this, the jury is then able to go into a third round um, where, the, uh, where each image is reviewed sometimes for hours. Moving on from the specialized jury, a smaller selection per category is made, and these are then pushed into the general jury section. Now, the general jury conducts a more holistic overview in also what the nature of that year's contest should be. What is the position of World Press Photo? What are the stories that matter? And how, how do they uh, convey the message, those photos, that the jury considers valuable for the world to see? So, in effect, the essence and the zeitgeist of the World Press Photo content is also changing with the times, with this independent jury. The World Press Photo Foundation itself acts as a platform to nurture this dialogue. And then we are able to uh, create our uh, annual collection. This is an immense responsibility for all the jury members, because they also carry the reputation of the foundation when when they engage in these conversations. So now I'd like to move on to the next slide and speak shortly about um, press freedom. So I'd like to also recommend um, that uh, you engage with the Reporters Without Borders uh, initiative. So this is also an NGO, it's an independent NGO, which uh, conducts also a consultative status with the United Nations and UNESCO. And it's a qualitative and quantitative analysis that uh, reports on the abuses and acts of violence against journalists. Now, this is how we begin to develop um, a World Press uh, Freedom Index. And based on this, we can also see how, um, how varied representation and freedom of speech, freedom of... Uh, uh, of opinion and press freedom altogether are distributed in the world. And we can see here that um, there are multiple countries that are in different stages. So another thing that I would like to also bring up is the aspect of COVID. This is effectively a new challenge um, that COVID-19 pandemic also uh, exacerbates the situation around press freedom. You could consider how a pandemic like COVID-19 becomes a threat to press freedom. But people in power can use a crisis to cement their power. And if you reduce also freedom of movement, you can use this as a form of suppressing press freedom. So looking also at COVID-19 regulations as a pretext in order to limit information going out. Or also in the past year, what we have seen is that part individual journalists have been even sentenced or imprisoned for reporting on the pandemic and on the status of the pandemic. So the importance of press freedom cannot be under underestimated or understated and actually only becomes increasingly more important, more valuable and more pressing. If we move on to the next picture, I would like to look a bit back into the history of um, press photography and photojournalism. So this is an image of Robert Kappa. And Robert Kappa is um, 
one of the, um, I think, most famous war journalists uh, in, in history. Um, and he, um, so I would like to also speak about the danger of uh, particularly war photography. So Robert Kappa was famously quoted to say, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. Now, the reality around war photojournalism is, of course, that it is increasingly dangerous uh, and always has been. Um, and Robert Kappa himself also was fatally injured uh, in the Indochina war, which led to his death. And this is, this is a part of the, the, the very real dangers met by many, uh, many photojournalists. So I'd like to move on to the next slide. Um, which is an extremely famous photograph by Robert Kaffa. And this was made uh, in 1936 uh, during the Spanish Civil War. And it is titled the, A Loyalist Militiaman at the Moment of Death. Now, the reason that I bring up this picture is because it is extremely iconic. Um, but there is also the question, there is a bit of a question around this photograph. And um, it was... Uh, the authenticity of the photograph itself was later brought into question. I will reflect on this um, in a few moments, but there were, were there was evidence also uh, considering that this was actually a staged photograph. And what does that do to the reliability of this image and of this story? So. Now I'd like to return back to World Press Photo with the, uh, with the following slide. So here we see an overview from 2010 to 2020 of the World Press Photo winners. Um, I think many, many uh, of us are aware of these images. Um, and we can also see how the, um, so going from the bottom right till the top left, uh, we go from 2010 to 2020. And um, I'd like to just quickly review some of the contest rules when we, when we look at how, um, how World Press Photo uh, stands as an index for accuracy as well in the field. We have multiple um, uh, manipulation checks and entry rules that demand that each image is a single frame or single exposure image. We ensure that no manipulation occurs within the image that can in any way change the meaning of the image. We have two independent digital analysts who also read the metadata and determine whether the content of every and any picture has been altered. And based on this, the image can be eliminated. After, um, after these uh, digital manipulation checks have been done, there are, is also additional fact checking behind the actual stories. And if any manipulation has also been made to the captions or to the stories that have been attached to the images upon entry, they can also be disqualified. This is the reputation that, um, that we stand on. We, we believe very much in the importance of having reliable visual journalism because we understand, especially in the digital era where we are overwhelmed by visual culture the importance of being uh, aware that something is not in any way manipulated or not fake news effectively um, becomes ever more important. Um, so even if we look at how uh, we, we understand image culture today, it's extremely present through our social media outputs, through the way that we interact with one another. But even if we look at digital publishing, for example, in newspapers, if I could um, recommend even looking at um, an, an online newspaper that you might read, what you might see is that instead of using a single image, they even use slideshows. So we're becoming extremely saturated with visual culture and becoming more literate also with visual culture, more dependent on it. And for this reason, the reliability and authenticity behind those stories becomes ever more important. So, I'd like to move on to the next slide and just quickly share with you the first World Press Photo winner. This was in 1955, and I would just like to reflect on how much we've moved from this point. So during this, uh, this year of contest in 1955, there were only 300 photos. And 
uh, World Press Photo started as a Dutch initiative and began to develop and became the global um, identity and foundation that, uh, that we know today. As I said earlier, uh, we are now looking at an average of about 47,000 photographs uh, every year. So we've, we've really developed and uh, this also m mirrors the pre prevalence of photojournalism when we are looking at uh, our media culture. So looking a bit at the legacy of World Press Photo, we move on to the next picture. This photograph by Charlie Cole, Tankman. Um, many of you may be familiar with. And I always like to ask what people actually know of this story. And this image is something that somehow almost overtakes the story behind it and becomes iconic and representative of a much larger um, occurrence or event, historical event. So this is an image of a demonstrator confronting the People's Liberation Army tanks in Beijing during the, pro the student protest for democratic reform on Tiananmen Square. I would recommend that everybody look further into also this story and understand how expensive this story is and the status that a single image can have in our shared visual history. This is the power that a photograph can have. It can shape a collective understanding of our own history. And this is why the authenticity and uh, a credibility of a photograph becomes ever more important. So now I'd like to move on to the following image. So this was um, our World Press Photo winner of 2008 um, by Ronaldo Schemmet. This was during the um, Caracas, the, the Venezuelan protests uh, against uh, Maduro, against the president Maduro. And this was of a young protester of 28 uh, who was set alight during these protests. Now, one of the aspects that startled me greatly when this <clears throat> photo was in contest, I was already working with the foundation um, and I was able to, to research this. And, and what I found was that a lot of individuals sort of reacted to this photograph asking why he hadn't intervened whilst taking it. But the reality is that we see this moment, but this only took a few seconds. The photographer himself spoke about how this happened within five seconds. And then immediately a group of people began to, to put the man out. I also want to say that um, the young man, Jose Victor Salazar Balsa, um, also survived and um, was treated for his burns um, and made, made a healthy recovery. But the photograph made impacts and ripples across the world about a situation that is extremely complicated and impacted the entire global discussion around what was happening in Venezuela and continues to. So although there may be um, the ethical conversation around photojournalism to begin with, the phrase um, a photo can say a thousand words uh, is almost an understatement because the impact that it can have on our global discussion around human rights, around politics, uh, around our present day reality um, is extremely impactful and cannot be understated. I'd like to also take a moment to look at um, ethics. And if you move on to the next slide, um, I'd like to, uh, this is a picture by uh, photographer Mohammed Badra. So photojournalism is extremely uh, delicate, especially when we're looking at war photography. Um, it is a lot about trust and the trust that the photojournalist develops with, with his surroundings, with the people that he is portraying. And the story of Mohammed Badra is one that I've always found um, particularly impactful. So this photograph um, was uh, made during the Syrian revolution and it was um, taken in, um, one moment, it was taken in 2018. And this is uh, the aftermath of an alleged gas attack at an improvised hospital in Eastern Bhutan. Now, at this point, um, many Western photographers who may have more traditionally been um, going to Syria to document the war, many of them were no longer uh, 
feeling safe enough to be able to enter this region. And Muhammad Badra, who himself is Syrian, saw it as his, his responsibility to begin to document what he was witnessing as a form of um, archiving, very actual uh, reality that he was experiencing within his community. His sensitivity towards his subjects, he also himself expressed that he would engage with his subject and to think to himself, if this was my family, would I portray them in this way? And only then would he take this picture. And um, now I would uh, like to also um, reflect on um, the, the, well, I mean, this is the, as the as ethical aspect of photojournalism is, of course, very complicated because it is not the responsibility of the photojournalist also necessarily to interfere with the situation, but to create a living archive and documentation and representation of an incident in order to communicate it with the world to create a larger impact. Now I would like to move on to introduce you to Esther Horvath. Um, so on my following slide, I would like to, if we could move on, thank you. Um, so this image uh, was a winner of the 2020 uh, photo contest. Um, it won within the environmental category, uh, first prize, and it was taken for the New York Times. So I'm very, very happy and proud to be able to present Esther Horvath to you today. Uh, she is a documentary photographer and a fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers. Um, so I've always uh, just found also the story behind this photograph incredibly impactful. It tells so much about the research behind it and the many months that you worked behind it to get this one very magical moment. Um, I find it extremely captivating and I'm very excited to, to hear you speak today. Thank you, Samir. It's uh, so beautiful to be here uh, and talk about my work, about uh, polar science photography and uh, yes, to share also this image in the behind the scene. I would like to talk a little bit how I get into polar science photography and then I will move on to uh, an expedition from where I just returned. And I also have a little pressure because uh, the scientists that joined that expedition are also listening. So it's always a little pressure when I know that there are scientists in the audience. But yes, so I would like to talk a little bit about how I get into this uh, world and uh, what is the connection and the lo my love for this environment. In 2015, 2015 was the year when I started to work in the Arctic Ocean and it was an assignment from Audubon ma magazine. That time I still lived in uh, New York. During this very first assignment, during this very first uh, expedition, I completely fell in love with this environment. And I remember I spent s um, sleepless nights on the bridge of Healy, what we can also see here uh, in the picture. And during this time, during this uh, expedition, I decided that I want to work with scientists. I want to work uh, to raise awareness about this changing environment and uh, to collaborate with scientists to, to talk about uh, the Arctic. For me, uh, the, uh, my, my angle is that, because we all know that Arctic Ocean melts and the Arctic is the environment which changes the most, but who are the scientists? And also here I also want to emphasize that who are the engineers that are behind uh, this information, behind the scientific research and, and my way of uh, um, documentary photography is to show and talk about climate change and global warming through the work of scientists. Uh, the next photo, please. Uh, I know in the audience there, there are many students from the Eidenhofer University of Technology and that's the reason I want to also talk about, uh, about not only the scientific research but also about technology because you uh, students in the audience, you are the future of engineers who might work uh, in polar research if you feel connected or if you feel love. And uh, I want to emphasize that uh, during each ex uh, exhibition, uh, sorry, during each uh, expedition, scientific work uh, and engineer work and working together, the teamwork between scientists and engineers are extremely important because each scientific 
expedition is based on tailor-made um, uh, tailor-made uh, instruments, which are produced maybe only for that um, ex exped expedition or a long-term uh, observation. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, this is my long-term uh, documentary, which I started in 2016. It is it called Icebird, which is an airplane-based sea ice thickness research led by the Alfred Wegener Institute. And uh, since 2016, I have been following this um, research uh, with the base in Station North Greenland. And... Um, this is an airplane based uh, research where scientists fly from station north toward the, uh, towards the North Pole, measuring sea ice thickness. And the uh, um, Arthur Wegener Institute conducted these measurements in 2001, and since during this period of time, they measured a decrease of 24% in sea ice thickness. Next slide, please. I just want to show how life is on board of an airplane, airplane like this. This airplane was built in 1942, and but now rebuilt with the high, with high technology. And um, as I mentioned, each uh, scientist and, and also engineers, this is a team of scientists and engineers, what we can see in this picture, they fly from station north towards the North Pole and back uh, on a very low altitude, conducting CS measurements. I also want to uh, mention that uh, to uh, that the air, uh, that um, during these flights we have a very little comfort, meaning there is no toilet on board, uh, there is no soundproofing, no insulation, because um, engineers uh, want to keep this airplane on the lowest uh, weight possible. And uh, additionally, during each flight, we have to wear survival suit and uh, that feels like wearing a sauna. The next slide, please. I just want to show how these measurements are done. Um, the airplane flies uh, about um, 50 meters above sea ice, towing a torpedo-looking instrument. This instrument has a laser and, uh, and electromagnetic uh, instrument which has me which have measured the sea ice uh, thickness and this instrument flies on 50 meter uh, above the sea ice and actually that's that is the reason we have to wear a survival suit because it's in case uh, of any emergency landing on sea ice we have to be already ready uh, in uh, a survival suit uh, without that we would not uh, survive for many minutes and uh, this also requires very, uh, very much trained pilots who can fly at uh, that altitude and uh, concentrate for many, uh, many hours. According to new research, um, we can experience by 2035 uh, the first sea ice-free summer in the Arctic Ocean, which is for me extremely shocking and. This is also the reason why I want to work and why I'm, why I'm working in the Arctic uh, region, that I want to raise awareness about these changes because I don't want to live in a, in a world where we don't have sea ice, where we, where, we, where we don't know the Arctic in a way we know it now. The next slide, please. Now I want to talk about uh, the Mosaic Expedition. This is the expedition where I took the WordPress winning photo. What is this expedition exactly? Uh, this expedition, a Mosaic Expedition, uh, was a one year long scientific expedition when Polarst and Icebreaker was frozen in the sea ice and drifted in the Central Arctic Ocean by, by scientists from 20 different countries conducted climate research for one entire year. The next slide, please. As we arrived to the ice flow, um, that was the day when we saw the sun above the horizon, and from the next day, the sun was under the horizon, and we entered the twilight and the black darkness in a very short period of time. And engineers and scientists were running with time to install all the scientific instruments around uh, Polarstern on the sea ice. And uh, the time was 
uh, very, very short and uh, everybody wanted to make sure that before we enter the black darkness, all instrumentations are on the sea eyes. The next slide, please. Here we can see Matthew Shoup, who is a senior scientist uh, from University of Colorado, who mounts different instruments on an atmospheric tower. And for me, working on this documentary, it was always extremely fascinating. And, and many times I just couldn't believe that by taking these images to also know that here I was standing on a... 30, 50, 60 centimeter sea ice on a drifting sea ice and with 4,200 meter ocean under my feet and seeing engineers and scientists working with these instruments and building this scientific mini village around the uh, Polar Dam was just uh, fascinating also to witness. The next slide, please. Why this expedition was so uh, important? And the reason why it was so important is because uh, because first time measurements were done, and especially during the polar nights. From during the polar nights, um, this is the time when measurements are are missing, and there are very few, very little measurements uh, we can compare. And uh, having this night measurements during the polar nights during this winter period can create a, a baseline for future scientific uh, uh, exploration and research. And this is uh, why this expedition, uh, expedition was so important to understand the processes in the Arctic Ocean also during the winter time to be able to use the data also for more precise future uh, climate prognosis. And what we can he see here on this picture is the biogeochemistry team who was drilling sea ice cores to measure greenhouse gases and to understand that methane, which is trapped in the sea ice, how much methane will get into the atmosphere or sink in the, in the ocean. The next slide, please. It was very interesting uh, that uh, to, to also to witness and see that during Mosaic, we had the most modern high technology around us on the sea ice on the ship and uh, in the same time we lived a very simple life with no cell connection, no internet. It felt like we lived 100 years uh, ago but having this extreme modern scientific technology around us. And this station was the remote sensing site which looked like for me, for me it looked like a, a moon station and the goal of this station was to enable future satellite mission, missions to measure sea ice thickness on the sea ice, uh, sorry, snow thickness on the sea ice in order to develop better understanding how snow affects sea ice uh, decrease. This station drifted uh, many times uh, because of sea ice, as, as sea ice broke and uh, participants of, of the expedition had to rebuild this station many times. Next slide, please. So this is the, the, the winning picture, uh, which I took actually very much at the beginning of the expedition. And uh, for me, it also shows that science at extreme location is dictated by nature. It's uh, by weather and also wildlife around. And during the ex uh, expedition, we were guests in the land of polar bears where scientists conducted research in order to understand the changes of the environment. And um, as I mentioned, this happened at the very beginning. And I remember the moment when I took this picture, I felt that I captured a very special moment. And before I went uh, to the expedition, and I, I, this is also how I work uh, in photography, that before I go and I join an expedition, I always have visual images already in my head, what I want to photograph, how I want to capture. And I just wait for the moment to happen. And um, of course, like a scenario like this, you can just have wishes, you cannot order it. It's like it either happens or not happens. And But for me, in my head, I had an imagination that I wanted to photograph, I, I wished to photograph uh, polar bears who come close to the scientific installations, to the, to the ice floor where we, where we were. And I can photograph these layers that uh, 
the uh, polar bears being in their environment, being in their home, and then seeing also the human part, the human element, the installations that their scientists are there to understand the changes of their land and the, uh, everything during the polar nights. And I felt like when I when I photographed this picture, I felt that I managed to, to capture what I what I wished for. And I I remember this moment. I just felt a, a deep uh, gratefulness. Uh, when I when I when I captured it, and I, this is actually it always happens when I take a, a, a picture, which I, I I really like it. It's always feels like a beautiful, it's a beautiful feeling in, in, inside of me. The next slide, please. Um, I also want to show that during this expedition, we experienced many many storms and ice uh, breaking events, which was extremely challenging uh, logistically. Uh, the next slide, please. For example, uh, during uh, and and we were constantly in, in the polar nights and crossing the sea ice and moving forward on the sea ice was very challenging, especially during this breaking event because many times uh, we just you just didn't really see where we are stepping and uh, using a sled while moving forward, especially moving forward through cracks or through ridges was um, very important to cross these areas uh, safely. The next slide, please. Life uh, on Polash then continued, no matter what kind of weather we had outside or what kind of uh, event we had outside. And uh, I, during each expedition, uh, each work, I, I also always interested to how people live at these uh, remote locations because uh, one way, like one part, they work extremely hard every day. There is no weekend, there are no no holidays, no, nothing. It's just it's every day, uh, every day very hard work. And in the same time, there is also like some mini private moments. And I'm very interested for these private moments. And in this picture, we can see Sebastian Brück, who is a boatsman on Polarstern and uh, icebreaker, and Captain 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 Stefan Schwarz, who gets his uh, haircut. And I just found it very nice because there are no no hairdresser on Polarstern and there are no stores, no nothing. So if you need something on these expeditions, you have to solve it by yourself. And uh, Sebastian Brück opened his mini barber shop every night at seven o'clock and you, have, you could sign up for a haircut. I tried to get just a, a hairstyle, but he didn't, he didn't want it to do it. He only wanted to do haircuts and then I decided no haircuts for me. Um, the next slide, please. Um, we also had some uh, private uh, moments, uh, celebrations, and this was, I think, this is the northernmost Halloween party, whatever happened in the human history. And uh, we had American uh, scientists participants on the ex expedition, so we thought honoring them and making them feel home, it would be nice to do a Halloween party. So during this party, everybody had to dress up, and this was one of my favorite uh, costume. The next, uh, next one. As I mentioned, we, we don't have a uh, cell connection, no internet, no TV, no radio, no Netflix, no Facebook. And uh, so you have to find out, uh, figure out what you do in, in the evening. And I love to watch people doing different things in their free time. For example, here, through the Hole, who was our polar bear guard during the expedition, and she um, did her knitting every evening and created beautiful sweaters and hats and mittens and uh, different different uh, kind of uh, knitting uh, uh, articles. The next slide, please. This is the last photo from the from the mosaic expedition, and for me, this is uh, the main photo showing uh, this expedition. And for me, this was the main photo representing this uh, research because when I look at this uh, picture, it always raises the question to me that how far can we go to understand the planet? Because we discover space, uh, we discover deep seas, and also for the first time, the the depth of the central Arctic Ocean during the polar nights. And here, scientists walk on a drifting sea ice with only light coming from the polar star and their headlamp. And with their work, they highlight the future of the Arctic Ocean so that we have a better understanding how the changes will affect our life. Now I would like to go um, to the next uh, uh, project, uh, the next uh, 
story and uh, this is the place, the new Olison in Svalbard, uh, northernmost archipelago of uh, Norway. And this is from where I just returned today. I arrived back to Germany, Bremen, in the morning. So I have very fresh uh, memories. Actually, waking up in the night, I thought I was still in Svalbard. I, I didn't, like, I opened my eyes, everything looked weird, but I was sure I'm still in Svalbard. So my heart and all my feelings are still... A uh, uh, part of them are still there. Um, during this expedition, I concentrated on, on land-based measurements, on atmospheric measurements, and on permafrost measurements. Because uh, what is very important is that ecosystem in the Arctic environment is standing in front of a tipping point, and when when an entire ecosystem based and built on ice could collapse due to due to the global warming and climate change. And during this expedition, I wanted to highlight, and now we can go to the next slide, the work of, of scientists working uh, on the coastline of the Arctic Ocean. And one of the work what I, I documented were, were atmospheric long-term observ long observation of Alfred Wegener Institute. And here we can see Sandra Grassel, observatory engineer, who releases a weather balloon at midnight local time. And why are, this, uh, why are the long-term observations so important? Because if you talk about climate change, we cannot talk climate change if you look at just one day. We have to look at long-term data. And I'm extremely interested for these long-term observ observations because of the dedication of humans, dedication of scientists who, who dedicate their life to give very important uh, climate data for us. And for example, here, what we can, what is behind this uh, picture is that the atmospheric group of Alfred Wegener Institute has been contact, conducting atmospheric measurements at New Orleans on Svalbard for the past 30 years. The finding shows that Svalbard is the epicenter of climate change, where winter average temperature has increased by six Celsius over the past two decades. And this increase is much faster as elsewhere on the planet. The next slide, please. The other part of my documentary focused on long-term permafrost research. And on this picture, we can see Julia Boyke, permafrost researcher, and Bill Cable, engineer at the Bayerva uh, permafrost measurement site. And here, this is another long-term uh, observation, which is extremely uh, important to understand the changes. Bayerva was established by Julia Boyka in 1998 as a long-term permafrost observatory. And since the beginning of the measurements in 1998, she has observed an almost doubling of the seasonal to upper soil layer to almost two meters at the side. And here I just want to just uh, mention that this upper um, active layer is which uh, freezes in the winter at, and towed toes in the in the summertime and underneath uh, you can find uh, uh, permafrost and this active layer was from one meter from the beginning of the measurements grew, uh, grew to two meter and the next slide please i also documented uh, snow measurements because uh, snow can act as an insulating layer and hence influences the permafrost thermal regime and what we can see here is uh, Julia Martin, who measures the weight of the snow in her snow pit, which he digged every single day, many of them uh, watching her. It looked extremely exhausting. Um, and at, at, it is also at the Bayelva side, and she calculates the snow water equivalent. As I mentioned, snow is a very important factor which can influence the permafrost uh, the toe. The next slide, please. On this picture, we can see Christian Rasmussen, Julia Boyke, and Andrew Abramov, who deploy a soil depth measuring instrument, uh, which goes down until 2.3 meters, to measure soil depth temperatures to understand the active layer changing above permafrost. This is what I mentioned, that the more the permafrost is uh, towing, the, longer, the, uh, the deeper active layer uh, we are getting. And why? These measurements are extremely important because, according to scientists right now, there are 1,300 gigatons of carbon stored in the, in, the, in the permafrost. 
And this is uh, approximately the same what we have right now in the atmosphere. And they want to understand what happens if permafrost thaws and this carbon will be released in, uh, in the atmosphere. Um, here we can see Bill Cable and Frederica Misner with a temperature lens. And uh, this uh, equipment was uh, developed by Bill. And the, they use this instrument to measure sediment temperature under frozen lakes. The next slide, please. Sorry, the next slide, I forgot to say the next slide. Uh, so this was the lens uh, equipment. And the, the, uh, this picture is the drilling team. And um, during this expedition, uh, there were two teams, but divided in three different sections. The one was uh, working with permafrost and the Bayava side. There was another group, the drilling team, who drilled several sites around New Olison in the active soil layer and the permafrost. Um, we can go to the next slide. This is how a core of active layer looks like. And a scientist was, um, they wanted to understand how microbes influence the production of the greenhouse gases when permafrost thaws. After they took this uh, course, they took, the, took them into a lab. Uh, if you could please go to the next slide. So when scientists then worked in the lab and uh, processed uh, the samples there, and also they take them back. Actually, it's, it was a group of uh, United States, and they uh, take these measurements back to analyze this uh, further. The last five picture, what I want to show is, uh, is um, a new project of mine, which are portraits. Um, uh, it's, these are stage portraits of, of scientists holding an important instrument they are working with. And uh, I just wanted to create a, a visually, a beautiful visual experience showing them in the environment with, with their instrument. And uh, here, this is uh, Julia Boyke, who, are, who I already showed before, and she's a professor and permafrost researcher. She holds a soil temperature measuring instrument, uh, which we could also see before she deployed one of them. And this instrument is very important because she can understand, using this instrument, she can uh, measure the soil depth temperature to understand where the active layer is located above the permafrost. And uh, one thing I find so, so nice when, when I talked to Julia, she said that if she would not be a permafrost researcher, she would be uh, an expedition cook in the Arctic just to be in this environment. She has a deep love uh, for this environment, as, 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 as many as all of us who works uh, in the Arctic. The next slide, please. She's Frederica Misner. She's a mathemat mathematician and uh, she's working on permafrost modeling. Uh, in this picture, she sits with her computer front of the Blue House, which is the house of the German and French research station AVPF. And her job is extremely important that we can understand which are waiting, the, understand the changes which are waiting for us if permafrost uh, thaws. The next picture, please. This is Bill Cable, the engineer who holds a uh, temperature lens, which he constructed. To and it is used to measure temperature of the sediments under frozen lakes. Being an engineer, uh, Bill was always the one who always solved any kind of technical difficulties in our team. And also, uh, even if he had any issues with the uh, snowmobiles, it was uh, beautiful to having him uh, in this team. The next slide, please. Uh, this is Christian Rasmussen, uh, who is a, geolo a geologist, geologist by training. And his PhD thesis is on detecting permafrost thaw events in aquatic environments using novel sensors. The reason why I'm talking so much about this instrument is because, uh, as I mentioned in the audience, there are many students from the university, and I just want to highlight that there are there are so many also so many opportunities to work on on very important scientific research, and there are many uh, engineers. In, uh, in, in, in every expedition and teams. Talking to Christian, uh, who is in this picture, I remember that uh, one day we were very close to the shore and she talked about, she told, told me that since he was a child, 
he wanted to be and he dreamed about to work in the polar region. He said he grew up learning and reading about big explorers. I, I found this uh, story extremely beautiful. The next picture, which is the last one, this is Julia Martin, uh, a master student who holds an automatic snow depth probe, which is built by Bill, who we can see uh, so before. This instrument measured snow depth. Julia is a snow scientist researching how snow influences a toe of permafrost. And Julia told us that uh, at one even, evening conversation that the reason she's doing this research is because she wants to save this beautiful and only planet we live on. And I feel and then sh I share the feeling of Julia that this is also the reason why I do this photography, because I want to raise awareness about these changes to, to hopefully to, to save this planet and to bring positive changes where we live on. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Esther. That was uh, a really a, a very cold, but also a very beautiful experience with this marvelous light that you uh, have there in the in the northern re regions. I, I think uh, so. Uh, there there are a couple of questions. Um, is, is that okay with you, uh, Samira, as well? That I uh, pose some questions. Of course, yeah. One of the questions is a, a very practical one. How is it to deal with your camera when the the temperature temperatures are so low? Can you still operate the the camera, or uh, do you also encounter problems with uh, with the buttons and and things like that? It is very challenging, and this time usually I, sometimes I had three cameras with me. This time I had two cameras with me, and I had the exact same camera with me, same brand, same everything the same. And one was a, a brand new one, the other one I bought three years ago. And actually the brand new one gave up uh, after two days and I could oh not use goodness. it any, uh, anymore. So there are uh, techni technical challenges. And I was also surprised that the new camera just didn't manage and uh, the old one, which was in the Arctic many times, could to, could work well. But of course, yeah. there are many challenges with the battery and the zoom doesn't work anymore and my fingers are frozen. Yeah, it's incredible that you choose for such, such an um, incredible uh, um, challenge uh, visiting uh, areas in the world like this. I mean, there are more obvious uh, fields to uh, to go into and to make uh, photos, but you, uh, what's the reason why you uh, choose such extreme circumstances? Is the reason why I work in this environment because this is where I have, I feel a deep connection and a deep, deep love. Yeah. For the polar regions, and and when I when I'm there, that's when I feel I'm in my uh, element. And yeah. even I I have frozen fingers and I pain everywhere. It's I feel that I'm at the place where I want to be the yeah. want to be yeah. the most. Yeah, the, the the problem is of course that you don't have control all the time. I mean, how do you deal with the lack of control? I try to go with the flow and yeah, uh, yeah. try to make the best of, out of every situation yeah. and prepare with uh, as much as possible. And um, yeah, when you shot um, the bears, um, did you realize that was a winner? I mean, you were enthusiastic about it, that, that's what you said, but um, how big was it, and that enthusiasm? And, and do, you, do you recognize the quality of the, of the picture immediately yourself? When that situation happened and I photographed that event, I had a feeling that this uh, picture will be published um, many times and the, yeah. this picture become a known photograph. But I, I did not know that I might win the World Press, which was a dream of mine since I'm a photographer. Yeah, Actually, yeah. it is a dream of mine before I even was a photographer. It was I always imagined that that must be the most one of the most beautiful thing in the world, winning the WordPress. And that time I was not even a, a yeah. photographer, but visited the WordPress exhibitions. Yeah, you, you encounter a lot of extreme emotions, I guess, during your work. It's it's never a dull operation, I would say. To, it, to it, yeah. Yes, it's always a, a lot of emotions and uh, or like I just arrived back today and it's also like afterwards it's uh, uh, I have to deal with this emotion because I, I was overcharged with so many emotions and then in coming back to the world and especially now during COVID-19 it is very challenging. 
Yeah. What what sacrifices uh, are necessary in order to become a photo photographer uh, like you are? I um, I sacrificed uh, my private life. I would yeah. say that. Uh, that's quite something, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's that's really a path you choose in your life, and that's that's it. And then you yes. accept all the the negative uh, aspects of it, so that it's it's worthwhile anyway. Yes. Yes, that's, that's how you consider it. OK, great. Um, there's another question come up coming up from the audience. That's uh, what's the role of photo journalism when it comes to fake uh, news? I mean, you can portray a lot of things and you can also uh, compose a, a story that doesn't exist, but uh, still feels like a real story. And then you create fake news by by your photos. I, I guess that's the, the background of that question. Uh, could you comment on that? Um, I don't necessarily understand the question. What, but uh, well, what's the role of photo journalism uh, in, in 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 an era of fake news? Can we? Uh, yes. Yeah. Can we yeah. beat fake news by by having proper uh, photo journalism? I think what is very important always that to like whatever picture and what kind of. Uh, work we do to have the bright and detailed information about the pictures that um, there can be, for example, the the portraits what I what I did by the about the 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 scientists. Those will be stage portraits, and uh, those are not moments which I photographed by chance that they were working on something, and it was a very um, conscious decision I wanted to have this serious and also the caption will say that and uh, I think this is something very important to be very clear uh, in in work in photojournalism what we are photographing and to talk about it clearly how the picture was taken yeah it's also a fundamental value of the world press that uh, photos uh, are, are not manip manipulated, like you explained in, the, in your exactly. uh, introduction. Okay. So could I could I also yeah, yeah. Add, um, of, of course, of course, of, of course, it is yeah. it is definitely um, also the the, uh, the value of the poster journalist uh, in regards to the openness and authenticity of their images. But I I also would like to also mention this aspect of fake news and in the dialogue around it when we are titling it uh, something like this it also it's almost um it creates this idea that fake news is so simple that you can call it out but what it really demands is that we must also be be uh, vigilant in our in our own research in cross-referencing in being aware that um, it's not only about of course digital manipulation which is an issue but it's also about framing and context and where is something published and so it's also uh, the responsibility of the viewer to stay vigilant and that's also something I, I always hope that people take away from our exhibitions to understand the world is interconnected complex and um, it's best to just try and research as much to get as as, as broad an understanding of, yeah. uh, of an event as possible. But I have to I have one maybe critical mark a remark to make, and that's uh, that if you view the, the uh, world press photo, uh, a lot of people say it's so pessimistic, it's so it's such a lot of sad news, it's so dramatic, and uh, they don't feel that much comfort when they have visited the the, the world press. So it 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 emphasizes a lot of. Uh, uh, important but f uh, quite uh, alarming things in the world, whereas there's a lot of uh, uh, good things in the world as well, and that's not portrayed that often in the world press. Could you comment on that? Absolutely. Um, so, of course, I, I understand um, this is also effectively the legacy, I think, of photojournalism and world press photo. And um, I think there is where Esther's work is such a beautiful example of a more constructive uh, way of viewing a very you know, complicated climate shift, um, but it, it also brings us a sort of constructive understanding that we are working towards a different future, preserving yeah. also our world. Yeah. So it presents not only the problem, but also yeah. that we are working towards a solution. And we see, mm -hmm. I think, in general, and, and I also invite you to, to come to this year's collection, that the yeah. zeitgeist around our own visual culture is is developing and uh, the way that we, we interact with images is is changing. Yeah. 
I, I fully agree. Uh, so, but uh, let's continue with the program. We still have uh, another part of this program where we go over uh, the the winners of the 2020 uh, contest. And I uh, leave the floor to you and to uh, to Esther as well. Uh, Samir and Esther, you you go over the over the pictures. And uh, the audience is free to raise questions, indeed. And uh, well, this will take uh, uh, around uh, 20 minutes, uh, and then there is still opportunity to discuss some more uh, very important issue when it comes to photojournalism and making these wonderful and intriguing pictures. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so I've, I've, uh, I'd like to continue with the presentation, perfect. So um, I would like to present some of the winning images and um, Esther, I would also very much love to hear uh, your insight. Um, um, as, as I also spoke a bit, uh, Esther was part of the 2021 photo jury, so uh, it would be wonderful to have her insight on these images. Um, I'd just quickly like to bring up uh, some of the major themes that we saw also in the 2020 uh, photo contest, which is that we saw m multiple images um, of peaceful protest and a global sense of uh, youth movement demanding change. And this is what we see within our World Press Photo of the Year. This is the image uh, by Yasuyoshi Chiba called, titled uh, Straight Voice. And what this image is, um, is an image of a, a young man um, illuminated by mobile phones uh, during a blackout in Khartoum in Sudan. So uh, just to give you a bit of a, a context behind this image, uh, protests in Sudan uh, had broken out in December. Uh, 2018, um, and these these uh, were effectively a peaceful protest demanding an end to the 30-year rule um, of um, al the, 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 the then president Al Bashir. Um, and after a military coup uh, took place on 3rd of June, these government forces opened fire on unarmed peaceful protesters. Now, one of the interesting aspects or elements about the, within the Sudanese revolution is that social media was very much um, used to to uh, to distribute this information on on a global on a global scale and what we saw was that the entire world was reacting um, and demanding also um, change so one of the, um, the, the the government at that point decided to um, diffuse these protests by imposing blackouts and shutting down the internet and trying to just alienate uh, the people. Um, and this is an element which I feel the longer that you, you, you look into this image just becomes extremely evident. So just looking at the image, we, we, we are almost at eye level with the speaker and he is reciting a poem, a poem about the importance um, of protest. Um, and um, it might seem like a space which is extremely well lit, but if you look deeper, what you understand is that this image is only lit by mobile phones of individuals, and we are actually closing the circle of a small island of, of people who, who are well lit, and everything around is this immense darkness. So the layers of this image... The, 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 the nuances of storytelling are all within this one image. And I feel like that is one of the, 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 the strengths of this, this photograph. The, the reason um, it, it has also this immense impact and uh, passion within the speaker. Um, so this became our photo of the year. Um, I don't know if Esther, you would like to, to add anything? Uh, the only thing what I want to add is a, um, um, a, a, a personal note, which I also see it in this image that I remember when I had my very first portfolio review at uh, the National Geographic meeting, Cathy Moran and uh, Sarah Lean. Sarah Lean was that time, Sarah Lean is a former director of photography and Cathy Moran is a deputy director of photography now at National Geographic. And I remember they told me, gave me a feedback for my work to always focus on the beauty of it, on the beauty of it, what I'm doing. And they refer, referred to my science photography. But since then, 
when I'm out and when I'm photographing, I always had it, having my head to focus on the beauty of it. And and uh, when I look at this picture, is that's what I see here. It's a uh, it's uh, it's it's a uh, uh, a sad, a devastating uh, moment. But when I look at this image, I see the beauty of it and the way how it is photographed. It's just beautiful with the, all the light coming a little bit from behind. It looks almost like a painting. Wonderful. No, I, I also feel that there is, yes, absolutely, it's again, maybe moving towards this constructive element, that there is this demand for change and beauty and um, also looking back at uh, this other aspect of World Press Photo and uh, maybe this negative filter. Um, we see, I think, here a very clear reference towards wanting a shift in also the way that we tell these stories and how we look out towards the future as... as um, as this also inspires us that these things are possible, that we can demand change, that voices can be heard. Absolutely. Um, so I'd like to then uh, move on to the, the next slide, which um, is the World Press Photo Story of the Year 2020. Um, it's, um, it's very interesting because it was the first time that a long-term project was awarded the Story of the Year. And I'd also like to take a moment um, to reflect on why uh, we have a, a single category and a story category. Uh, one, of, one of the values that we see in uh, reportage is how a, an extremely complicated story uh, like, like what we see here can be portrayed by multiple images uh, collected together. Um, and that creates a very different way of storytelling as opposed to a single image. So this is why we have two um, two primary awards within World Press Photo, those being the Photo of the Year and the Story of the Year. So this Story of the Year was selected uh, from a long-term project. Um, long-term projects can sometimes encapsulate the, um, almost the entire career of a photojournalist and they can span decades. Um, so within our contest, it is, it is necessary that at least one of the images was taken within the year of contest or the year prior to contest. So this story here um, is uh, set in Algeria, and it's um, it is uh, called Ko, the Genesis of a Rebel. Algeria, where we see, um, according to UNESCO, there is a report that on average, 72% of people under 30 are unemployed. Um, and the sense of unrest and frustration is uh, palpable throughout this story. So, just like to to uh, to reflect on um, um, another very interesting element within within this series, which is that the photographer uh, uses a lot of football matches to to depict this frustration throughout the story. And I would also. Uh, yes, recommend everyone to, to go out and look at the story a bit more extensively. It's, it's a large collection of images and fortunately only four could fit on this slide. Um, so it's um, uh, creating also a sense of camaraderie. And this was also the choice in depicting football matches a great deal. Uh, as we can see in the top right, the sense of uh, group uh, dynamic where, where frustrations can be vented within a different space. So this is also a larger exploration into angst and unrest within contemporary Algerian society um, and captures, uh, I think, quite beautifully the complexity of that frustration uh, amongst, amongst the youth population. Um, so uh, it's also interesting if reviewing what we had in 2020, along with these depictions of um, yeah, this this shift in in young people demanding change. There is also an additional picture within the World Press Photo 2020 contest, which also looks at the, the same protest from a very different angle. So again, I would just really like to invite you all to look at the collection a bit more extensively. Um, I'm not sure if you'd like to add anything, Esther. I think we can go to the next one. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, so this picture, um, this picture is uh, photographed by Nikita Teryoshin, and I would just like to reflect on it because I think it is a very different uh, movement uh, in portraying um, war or an aspect of war. And, and Nikita Teryoshin was a nominee for the World Press Photo of the Year. He's a Berlin-based um, uh, 
a ph uh, photographer, and uh, this photo was made at the International Defense Exhibition and Conference in Abu Dhabi. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's a it's picture of a businessman locking away a pair of anti-tank grenades. So he, he spoke a great deal and did also a very uh, sort of research style project where he goes to multiple um, uh, defense conferences and depicts this uh, space between selling war and the detachment of the people behind it and what ultimately happens with those things. So one of the things that I also really appreciated about his work and, and, and the way that he chose to portray it, not only the fact that he is, you know, um, somehow exploring a different form of visual culture to or, or visual terminology to reference war, uh, in in a way that is also almost frightening. Um, he is so sensitive about not allowing uh, the individual's faces to be shown. And that's, he himself just felt that ultimately you cannot judge anyone who is within this position. You don't know their life story and it, they are not necessarily uh, to be associated with what is happening just because they are working there. And I found that that was a great uh, sense of care and uh, trust again that aspect of trust between the photojournalist and, and and their subject. Um, Esther, would you like to? The on, uh, uh, just very shortly, like I I love this uh, photo story a lot, and also the way how uh, it was shot very vividly. I know also the other because it's a photo story, and also the other part of this uh, story, and it was just an incredible idea to shot, like it's a, talking about war in a completely different way, and in a very vivid, uh, bright, colorful way, and it, uh, in the same time, very shocking way, like seeing this beautiful, shiny uh, room where these granites are t just locked away uh, in a safe place, and... Um, the reason why I love this uh, story because it's really just you, 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 it makes you think that um, and, and raise awareness and makes you think like okay how war is happening and and how these things works and and it, 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 it somehow it comes closer to you and uh, I, it also reminded me of a project from Tim Hatterington who did this, uh, the project Sleeping Soldiers and that was also talking war about war in a very different way and i love this type of uh, thinking show mm -hmm. something in a very different way absolutely oh, it's a really interesting reference as well uh, wonderful um shall we move to the next uh, slide thank you um, so I would like to bring up a second part uh, of the 2020 photo contest that I found so fascinating, which is again the role of environment. And um, what we saw, I think, throughout the collection uh, was that the climate crisis was evident within every category. And I think that that's also just very telling of the reality of our shifting climate and that it becomes pervasive within every facet of our lives. And for example, this, this picture by Sean Davey um, was also within the contemporary issues category, uh, which the previous picture also belonged to. Um, and this is an image of um, a temporary evacuation uh, center in New South Wales, Australia and a group of children um, playing after they had been evacuated uh, from um, their, their, their homes uh, due to the, to the bushfires that uh, raged for over a year, I think, uh, in 2020. So the widespread drought conditions that were higher than average, the soil dryness, and what we saw with climate heating um, sparked expensive, extensive uh, bushfires and forest fires globally and um, I found that this was a this was a, a very striking image to also understand the impact on everyday life on childhood um, and it has a certain sense of playfulness that that's almost um, deceptive I feel I, I've always found I don't know how you see this Esther uh, I, I absolutely share this uh, um, like seeing the children like playing as as as, as they are and in the background uh, uh, one of the biggest disaster of our history happening and that uh, disaster we influence also their life and uh, it's, it's a very powerful image also the, the colors um, um, yeah. I um I feel um 
yeah, this image always really, really s struck me. Uh, and absolutely, the colors are just, they draw you in so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we can move to the next slide. So this is um, the Nature Singles First Prize uh, winner by Alain Schröder. Um, this is um, a photograph of a, a month old orangutan. Um, they attempted to save um, after she was found injured, um, uh, also with her, with her injured mother um, at a palm oil plantation. And uh, Alain Schröder had done a very extensive uh, project um, where he had been um, in Sumatra and uh, Borneo and documented um, effectively the impacts of palm oil plantations, um, particularly on the orangutan, um, the orangutans and um, he, he spoke very, very uh, emotionally also about this story. So he spent a uh, very long time with the community of, um, of a rescue team. And also within the six month period that he was there because of the delicate nature of the orangutans, he was never allowed to, to touch them. He constantly had to wear um, also surgical gear, uh, gloves and masks in order to be able to take these photographs. And I, I think, you know, this image it, it's so it's so striking and so deeply impactful. And I've I've seen I mean when I still had the opportunity also to to tour with this exhibition. I mean I I just saw people, you know, really uh, really stopping in front of this image and really really being quite struck by it. I feel the same about it. This story is one of my favorites. Uh, uh, also, it uh, was a single and also as a story. And uh, it's such an important uh, picture and such an important work because it talks about uh, or palm oil plantation and what it means if we consume more products with palm oil in it, what are the consequences and what is the price we are paying and what is the price uh, the orangutans are paying for. And I find it's, um, this is, um, like we can photograph wildlife in a very different way to try to raise awareness and I feel that this way is an extremely powerful and extremely powerful way and um, I wish and I hope that many people see this image and, and this story and, and they think about that when they go to do uh, grocery shopping that they think about if they buy any product which he, which has palm oil uh, in it and uh, and it's like I feel very emotional about, about it, this picture, and also this is just beautifully shot. The, the it's, it's beautifully an extremely sad image. Absolutely, no, absolutely. I, I also hope it has the same impact because we really see the. I mean, also to 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 position these human hands and how much, how much we we are responsible. Um. So if we can move to the next image, um. So I would like to just take a moment to look at this. This is um, our first prize singles uh, portraits. Um, this is a photograph by Tomek Kasho. And um, for me, this, this image was also extremely impactful. It's very striking. Um, it is an image of a 15 year old uh, Armenian girl um, who had woken after um, being uh, within a coma-like state uh, due to resignation syndrome. And I, I, I remember first reading about resignation syndrome actually through World Press Photo. And I think that's, that's one of the interesting, or, or for me, one of the striking elements of this picture. So um, a few years ago, Magnus Venman also uh, had a winning image around uh, resignation syndrome, which is a form of, um, a form of a coma-like state, uh, which particularly impacts children who have recently migrated and are um, in an unstable situation where they are not sure uh, whether they are able to stay within their new host country and it's a it's um it's a it's a it's it's a very uh yeah i find it a very striking syndrome that has occurred and was very present within europe um and this image is of this 15 year old girl who had just woken woken up um in a re in, a res in a refugee reception center in uh, in poland 
So, of course, because of being able to look directly into our eyes, I think her eyes, I think that that has that immediacy and that um, all these hands sort of surrounding her, that sense of care that we see within that image also makes us understand the vulnerability of these individuals, that people who are migrating are just people and the dialogue around them sometimes, around, around people who are migrating or moving sometimes is so dehumanizing and these, yeah, yeah. I don't know if uh, you'd like to add anything else here. Um, I just would like to add that this uh, picture represents so much that uh, what is going on in Europe or or rest of the world and uh, with migration and how that affects children because um, this is uh, it's effect, if it, this affects their life for the entire life and that this this girl is looking into our eyes is extremely extremely touching and and. Uh, and uh, you just um, just draws into it, and uh, you you feel it, feel her pain, and feel the pain of the family. So it's a very important image to talk about a current situation. Absolutely. Um, so we can move on to the next uh, image. So um, this is a uh, an image that I. This is a part of a story, um, and it's it's actually within the sports category, and uh, it's first prize winner, titled "Rise from the Ashes" uh, by Wally Scale. Um, and the this image is is uh, in the aftermath of a forest fire in Paradise, USA. And um, I think you know I think we also heard a great deal about Paradise, which was. I think 90% of its of its community was uprooted and lost their homes through the forest fires in the in the region. And um, if we could move to the second slide, we we look at this as a sports story because what actually happened within this community, whose entire uh, livelihood was ravaged, their homes were t were destroyed, is that they continued to come together um, around their sports team and to continue to play American football and support their team. And I think that it is a striking uh, and beautiful portrayal of the way that community can allow us the, the, the space to actually make change towards and give us the strength for change. So, so also the challenges that we face can be, can be confronted with a sense of community. And I feel like looking at a sports team, illustrating that sense of togetherness in such a in such an overwhelming uh, tragedy, ultimately, um, yeah, it's it's again a piece of constructive journalism portraying a very very difficult situation. Um, not sure if you'd like to add anything else. Yeah, uh, also because maybe of time we can move to the next one. Yeah, perfect. So um, this is also a part of a story, and uh, this is a. Um, a spot news story, second prize, uh, by Matthew Abbott. Um, and I just wanted also to add this, and this is the last story that I will uh, talk about. Um, so this is um, also an image um, in the in the uh, aftermath and during the, the larger bushfires in Australia. And I've always just, um, one thing that I found very interesting is that Matthew Abbott made the story over the time of the year almost. and. He also told stories about, you know, having to continue life whilst, uh, you know, the entire country was on fire. I mean, I think he even got married during this period. And what I found so impactful about this story is, of course, the immediacy of what we see is that the fires raged to such temperatures that the aluminium in the car, in fact, melted. And then it's just extremely impactful also to show to show the reality and severity of the crisis that we are that we are living the only thing I want to add here is the power of one single image, and uh, with one one single image, you can't tell uh, a full story. Uh, here, it has so many layers, and also it is a devastating uh, story and shot in a beautiful uh, way, which is uh, you just discover. You want to discover every single uh, point of it, and um, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, so this concludes also the uh, the selection of 2020 photos. I'm very, very happy to have been able to discuss them with you, Esther.
yeah, I, I was very happy to talk about it with you, Samira. Thanks very much. Uh, it was uh, wonderful to hear all your stories. And that last story also uh, um, came with the, with the dilemma sometimes that uh, a picture can be really beautiful while depicting something horrible. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's of, often the case, I guess. Uh, and uh, one of the questions of the audience is what's more important in photo journalism? Is that the aesthetics or the story behind, behind the, the picture? I mean, both are, of course, important, but for instance, in your work, Esther, what uh, what appeals the most to you, the, the 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 aesthetics of the of the picture or the story that you like to tell? Can you comment on that? It's it's for me it's equally important that because if I want to tell a story, I w I also want to represent it and show it with beautiful images where people beautiful aesthetic where people would stop. Because if they stop because of the beauty of the image, they will also read the caption and will read about it. And that's that's the, my goal with science, polar science photography, that I want mm -hmm. to create beautiful images that people stop and read about the caption and read about climate change and read about what is happening. And for me, it's absolutely equally important. Okay, and then there comes a, a very technical question, a very practical one as well. What's the brand of camera that you're using while you're making your pictures, uh, Esther? I'm using a uh, Nikon. Nikon, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, any type or, uh, or it's set a, of secrets? It's a D850, what I'm using, and uh, one is working and one is not working. No, maybe <laughs> people think People think if you buy the right camera, you make beautiful pictures, but it's not that simple <laughs> like it's, that. But, uh, no. But it's, uh, of course, good material is uh, something to start with, of course. Uh, then there is a question for you, Samira. What's your personal favorites uh, when it comes to the World Press uh, winners? Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe you can you can look it up or maybe you can describe the picture that comes to mind. I have so many <laughs> to be yeah. very well, sure. What's, what's the first that pops up when this uh, this kind of question is uh, come across? Um, well, no, I have to I have to be very honest that for me in 2020 there were two pictures that really stood out, and that was Esther's photo uh, really stayed with me. I, uh, on a personal note, I was raised also as quite an avid environmentalist, so it just had such a deep impact on me, and I found that it had this incredible magic and. Again, this you know, I, I just think that the story behind it um, is very inspiring. Also, just the dedication that it takes to be able to take such a photograph, to 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 push yourself into such extremes, to be able to bring that story out to the world. I I think it's really a beautiful representation of photojournalism, and um, I feel very strongly about this. So this has been such a pleasure. Um, other than this, I I'm I'm a great fan of uh, Sabi Hachiman. Uh, she made a long-term project in the 2020 uh, collection that I thought was so playful and beautifully composed and also um, so delicate in the treatment of its uh, subject. So it's, it's, um, it's about a, a, a dedicated uh, school, a religious school in which girls are studying the Quran. And, you know, every time that I see it, it's very playful. It's sort of documenting portraiture. And it just, I always have to think, it tells us and teaches us on a deep level this sort of universal truth that, you know, girls just want to have fun. <laughs> it's, it's, it's got this playful, yes, this beautiful playfulness to it. And, and I, I, I find it really, um, a really layered portrayal. And, um, okay. yeah. That, that looks really hopeful. That's that's wonderful to conclude uh, this evening. But we still have one question left, and the question was, uh, uh, how was it to, to be part of the jury? Uh, uh, if I may raise that question for, for Esther, M maybe you can comment uh, briefly on that. How was that experience for you? It was uh, wonderful. First of all, it was a, a great honor when I got the email from WordPress. Uh, I was very surprised and uh, uh, it was a great honor to be a part of it. And uh, as a photographer, uh, it was also uh, important. It was also important that I understand how WordPress works also for my new, for my next uh, applications and to understand how the how jury works and um, it was a w wonderful very intense work uh, we had I think 6,000 images to look through and very intense conversation very deep and very, a lot yeah. of work but I enjoyed every single second of it yeah 
it's really challenging, I guess. It was uh, quite quite an effort to to pick the the, the right ones from it. Uh, okay, we can continue discussing that, uh, but we we really really are running out of time. Before I I'm going to thank you, I would like to. Uh, to say that uh, the link to the US registration will appear in the chat uh, uh, any minute, so you can um, you can fill in the form and uh, you have your re registration for that. And um, uh, for now, I um, I want to say that uh, we will have a live World Press photo uh, that will appear in November of this year, and I'm confident that all pandemic problems are then solved and we will enjoy a live show. Uh, I enjoyed this evening very much and I enjoyed your stories and all your dedication, but the real show is of course the one that we really should visit and discuss mm -hmm. with one another while we go uh, through the exhibition and uh, it's, it's a lovely uh, experience to look forward to. Uh, for now, I really like to uh, thank you, Esther Horvath, and thank you, Samir Damato, for for your wonderful presentations, and uh, say goodbye to the audience and hope to see you in the next quarter. Have a good evening and see you again. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. bye.